Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Sound Decisions here on Passion for Sound. Today is part one of an interview I held recently with Dan Schmolly. Dan is the founder and director of Bottlehead as one of the people directly involved with the design of the kits. As he'll say himself, he's not the key designer, but he's certainly got a very hands-on approach to the products that come out of the Bottlehead brand. Before we get into the content, I just want to congratulate viewers Graham Bloor and Banana Joe for winning the DC01 and DC02 respectively in the recent giveaway. I've left you guys messages on the comments that you won with but as yet haven't heard back so please do make sure you email me through the link below to let me know your details to claim those prizes. I also want to make mention of one of Passion for Sound's patrons, Red Rich, who actually won the DC01 twice um, but he elected to not go ahead and, and take the giveaway because he didn't need it for his system so thank you for your generosity of not taking that piece of equipment and passing on for somebody else. But I would like to also point out how beneficial it obviously is to be a patron. Those extra chances led to Red Rich actually coming up twice in the random number generator because of those extra entries. So if you want to win more gear, check out the Patreon link below and see if one of the tiers is right for you. In this part one of the interview, Dan and I talk about the origins of Bottlehead, what Dan's experience is in uh, dabbling in the recording world, in reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and then obviously how he got into creating kits for enthusiasts like us to go and create tube amplifiers and the like. In this part one, we begin to touch upon some of the characteristics of tubes and how they compare to solid state and I asked Dan to actually either confirm or bust some of the myths about tubes and I think he does that really effectively. So we start to get into some philosophy around audio and enjoyment before ending it just before we start talking about impedance matching and that's going to come in part two. So I'll sit back now, let you watch part one of the interview with Dan Schmolly from Bottlehead and I hope you enjoy what he has to say. Can you tell me a little bit about the the equipment behind you, what's this space that you're in? Oh, yeah, I guess I guess more or less these days it's a museum here. I, I'll give you the my wobbly chair uh, pan shot here. That's mm -hmm. my uh, Ampex ATR over there uh, behind my shoulder there, and then uh, uh, that's a quarter-inch two-track tape deck that uh, uh, retired from the tape project when I retired from the tape project a few years okay. ago. That was actually one of the slaves that was uh, making the dupes that you can buy. Okay. Um, and then uh, over my other shoulder here is an Altec 250 SU uh, two console, 10, 10 channel console. Really, a uh, really classic piece of gear. Uh, these days, you know, everything's done in the box, as they say, and you know, all the all the uh, knobs and stuff are just up on your screen. But this is from the very, very early days of of re the recording industry, and basically, these boxes were just a bunch of two mic preamps that and and a, and a mixer circuit. So, okay. um, it's uh, really got a the, the Altec stuff has a real unique classic sound to it. So, uh, mm. uh, got the opportunity to get a hold of one and restored it, and uh, we play around with it a little bit. Hopefully, we'll be doing some recording with that pretty soon. Yep. And then uh, next to that is uh, a Nagra T uh, tape deck again, quarter inch two track. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see. Back, hiding behind it, there is a Studer A80 tape deck that's a, a, a one-inch machine that uh, someday I hope to convert to a uh, one-inch two-track, which is a, um, basically a mastering format that's used okay. in, in, in mastering studios these days. Um, sometimes uh, artists like to take a, a high-res digital file and uh, sweeten it a little bit uh, with, with the nice effects that tape can add to that, okay. uh, which is a whole subject I'm happy to get into. Uh, I was going to say that. That's the purity like of sound and the accuracy yep. of recording is uh, is a myth. But anyway, that's a deck that hopefully we'll we'll be able to use for some of that. And and then up right up there, yep. I just happen to have uh, uh, a dummy with my uh, one of my pairs of K1000 headphones up there. Yeah, uh, you don't see those around very often. Uh, no, I have a couple pairs. Um, I really like them. They're they're pretty cool. They're uh, you know they're not really an ear ear phone. They're in your speaker. They stand off mm -hmm. your head, and I think that that uh, does a lot for giving a sense of space when you're listening to headphones, which is something yeah. that. With my particular hearing, I, I struggle a little bit with the with the uh, sense of realism with headphones. So um, th those help that a lot, and they 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 just they sound really good. So um, I I actually have uh, let me see let me see if I can pan the other way here and maybe back <laughs> in the distance there. 
there that red uh, box there is uh, called the Neo Thoriator. That's a uh, uh, yep. headphone amp that that uh, Paul Berkland and I uh, sort of co-designed and uh, he put together several years ago. Mm-hmm. That I built with the intention of uh, powering K1000s because they have a yeah. kind of unique requirements of a little bit more power and so on and so forth. So that was kind of a little showpiece we did. Nice, nice. Was that the one that wasn't the one that was the precursor to the main line? Was it? There was a different uh, precursor. No, that's that's quite a bit different circuit. This this is this thing's kind of insane. It uh, uses eight forty five tubes, which are a really huge thoriated tungsten filament triode that can is capable of putting out about twenty five watts. We're wow. running it at about four watts. We're running them very mm-hmm. gently. Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite a bit different. The main line uses a little, uh, really cool little tube called the 6C45 Pi that is actually a sort of a descendant of uh, the Western Electric uh, WE437A tube, which is a, a really super, super linear triode that Western developed uh, many years ago for use in telephone service. So uh, that's a, yeah, that's a little bit different setup. Uh, than, than this guy, but um, I, I say that the thing that they share is they're both very, very, very linear circuits, and we can get right. into what linearity is in, in, in tube amps and, and how that works there down the road. Yep. Fantastic. Cool. Thanks for the little, uh, the little tour. That's great. Yeah. So let, let's actually continue on that thread. What was, I guess, in the, in the short version at least, because there's probably lots to it, but what was the journey for you through into today running Bottlehead and making kit uh, tube amps for headphones, speakers, now you've got DIY speakers as well. Where did that all begin and what was the genesis of that? Probably my life story is I'm a person who's uh, made the grievous error of turning hobbies into businesses a few too many times in my life. So... (laughs) Uh, I have, I've had some experience in, in, in the recording industry. I don't call myself a recording engineer by any stretch of the imagination, Mm -hmm. but I have, but I have good friends who are recording and mastering engineers. And, uh, I've spent a lot of time learning a huge amount from them. Uh, My initial, I think, delving into tube audio in particular was that I started collecting antique radios back in the early 90s Mm. and started fixing them myself and um, uh, that involved going to swap meets and and, you know spending a lot of time scrounging up vintage tubes and in that process I ran into the the local community here in the Seattle area that were guys who were into vintage tube audio and got to know those guys pretty well and the upshot of that was in the uh, mid 90s we started a club called uh, Valve and we put out a little newsletter, had local club meetings, and uh, um, guys would bring over their vintage tube gear, and it kind of evolved from vintage tube gear into vintage tube gear they'd modified, and then we kind of kept going f- further and further that way, and guys were developing their own circuits and building their own amps and bringing them in. And uh, um, at one point, we decided to uh, have a meeting where we built a very, very simple circuit using a really cool t- tube called the 6DN7 that allowed you to build a, an amp with one tube. Mm. Uh, we put that together. We threw a cheap little speaker on it, and uh, all the guys in the room were gobsmacked. We, we were just knocked mm-hmm. out by how good something so simple could sound. Yep. So we decided to turn it into a kit for the local gang, and the word got out. And from there, we started basically started Bottlehead. We started making mm-hmm. a few kits, and... and uh, it, it slowly, <laughs> definitely slowly grew from there. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, it's community now, though. Uh, it, we're doing fine. And, uh, you know, 25 years later, we became an overnight sensation. So so it, it went from there. And, and in, as, as that continued to develop, I just had the amazingly good strokes of luck to have a few guys who uh, are pretty well known in the recording industry contact me and say they were kind of interested in what I was doing. And I formed some pretty good friendships. Uh, and, and that kept developing to where I got involved in, uh, uh, construction of new studios with these guys and building Uh, gear for them. Uh, in particular, Paul Stubblebine, uh, I worked with for, for many years and, uh, he had a pretty massive monitor system. He actually had one of the very, very first prototype, uh, Magico speaker systems. 
and um, I helped put together uh, a very complex uh, set of tube amps and crossovers for that. I think there were four amps on each side. Wow. With a four way crossover mm -hmm. and a tube line driver. That was his monitor system in his mastering room. So um, uh, from there, uh, we, you know, kind of continued to develop the friendship over the years. And a few years later, we started the tape project together yep. along with Michael Romanowski, another very good mastering engineer. So that allowed me to get to know more people in that end of the business, which was invaluable to learn not only how to play this stuff back, but how it's made in the first place and, and what the what the real criterion are, what the real priorities are when you do that stuff. Um, really, really, really helped me. I sort of sculpt and carve the way we wanted our stuff to sound and how we wanted it to work to deliver that in, in the end. So that, um, that's something that probably has had a, really big influence on what I would say is Bottlehead's house sound. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, How would you, you describe that sound? What, what, what well, um, for me, when I started listening to tube amps, I really fell in love with the, the, the natural sort of uh, maybe nurturing quality, you'd say, mm. particularly in vocals, the, the, the way that the tube sound draws you in. Uh, and and it's very relaxing that it it's it doesn't really uh, uh, usually doesn't cause fatigue. It doesn't usually have an edge to it that might sort of wear you out after a while. However, I also found that with a lot of tube gear, particularly when you're looking at some of the vintage gear, and I I won't name any names because it just there's too many fanboys of various yeah. brands and it <laughs> creates a lot of problems. But but I found that there was a lot of vintage gear out there that eh, it's kind of fat, kind of slow on the bottom end. And it really mm -hmm. didn't, didn't, it, it had a charm to it, but it, in the long term, it wasn't that satisfying to me. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could take the tube circuits and, and retain what I thought was the real attractive parts of it, of, of, of the, the incredible mid range, the very, very sweet top end. And, um, kind of focus on one thing at least on getting that bass to be more articulate and making sure that it goes really deep so that's one aspect of our stuff that i think particularly in our high-end products that's that's a real important issue things like our our mainline uh headphone amp i i, you know, I think you you've you've mentioned in your review of it that it has mm -hmm. tends to have that that character that it's a little bit more if you will solid state like in the bottom end absolutely uh, yeah, that I think that's that's a thing you can say to a tube guy, and he doesn't get upset when you say that. If you say solid state, the top end, he freaks out. But if you say that at the bottom end, he goes, "Yeah, I get what you're saying." Absolutely, yeah. So, so that's part of it. And, and as I say, retention of the uh, the other qualities at the same time mm -hmm. is a real challenge. Uh, otherwise, we just all switch to solid state. But to keep that balance is uh, it's a little tricky, and the approach that uh, we decided to take after a lot of, a lot of flailing around. I spent a lot of time in the, in the, uh, mid to late nineties, uh, with guys like John Tucker and John Camille, just trying everything we could think of, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, not only components, you know, change the wire, change the capacitor, but actually doing that on a circuit level where let's, let's try, <laughs> A, shunt, a voltage shunt regulator, let's try a series regulator, let's try doing it with these parts, let's try doing it with tubes, let's try doing it with solid state, whatever. Yep. We did we did tons and tons of that stuff and, and found that there were a lot of issues in power supply design that were causing those issues with, with tube amps. It wasn't necessarily in the, the tube that you were listening to itself, mm -hmm. it was how, how the, 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 the power was getting to it. Yeah, yeah. Voltage and the cons and the and the the voltage and the uh, current were not in a in a constant state. So yep. we started to work on constant current sources and uh, shunt voltage regulators and anything we could to help give the tubes the the cleanest, most consistent power. And mm -hmm. that really seems to help. And so so that stuff tends to go through all of our products, even our most simple products like. Our Crack OTL headphone amp has an upgrade that you can add to it that puts a constant current source in. And I think most people find that the that the you know 
the change is real obvious when you put it in. Yeah, you can, you hear the bass tightens up, and you know Absolutely. the notes get more definition. It gets more dynamic, and so on. Yeah. yeah, I remember way back when I first built a crack kit, and that that's the speedball up, upgrade you're referring to, isn't it? Right. Right. Yeah. That the difference. That's probably one of the biggest differences I've ever heard in in one of those sorts of upgrades. So having worked my way through the crack and then the single ender experiment kit and now the main line, um, none of them transformed in quite the same way. So with, whether it was capacitors being changed or tubes being changed, that speedball upgrade was a huge difference. Right. Well, that's why I try to uh, keep trying to preach that changes in the circuit tend mm. to have a lot more influence than throwing boutique parts at things. And there's nothing yep. wrong with boutique parts. That's a great thing to do. It's an easy way to get into to modding things, which I which I think is totally cool. I don't want people to just build our kits and just say that's it that's necessarily. Awesome. You can, and that's great. And, and in fact, that's what I do anymore. I don't really bother with a lot of, of, of uh, fancy stuff after the fact. But uh, uh, when you want to get into this and continue pursuing the hobby, it's fun to be able to make changes and make Absolutely. improvements to things. So we try and package those things that might be a little more daunting to do on your own, where you have to put a bunch of parts on a PC board and put it in there to make it happen. And generally, those have a lot more impact than just changing a piece of wire or just changing mm -hmm. a capacitor. Let's take a bit of a deep dive into tubes and, and sure. maybe confirm some of the truths and bust some of the myths as we go, because <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of them around, sure. Um, so the, the first question I've got on my list was, are tubes less resolving than solid state? Is, is that a given? Of course, that's a subjective question, so it's quite loaded, but... Uh, no, tubes is a big sweeping term. There's a lot of different kinds of tubes. There's triodes and there's pentodes and there's tetrodes and there's all sorts of other stuff. But if you go the direction I went, which was to focus on triodes, triodes tend to be uh, very linear and certain triodes are exceptionally linear. And those tend to be the ones that fall into uh, the, the single-ended audio amps that, that, that we work with. And those would be things like the 300B tube, the 2A3 tube, the 45 tube. Uh, if you get into things that are a little more exotic, like the 845 tube. Um, those tubes are all very, very linear, which means that they don't distort as easily as something like a, a transistor does. A transistor needs to have uh, a, some feedback in it to keep it linearized, whereas these triodes can be quite linear without it. So inherently, something like a triode is a, is a, is a more linear, cleaner sounding thing to begin with. Interesting. Tubes is you can put a bunch of voltage on them and they swing great amounts of voltage with a given signal coming in. So they slew, their slew rate is, is much larger okay. than something like a transistor, generally speaking, mm. uh, particularly with, the, with, with these linear output tubes. So you've got a great slew rate, you've got a very linear device what's not to love about it okay excellent excellent and we'll talk i think i've got a question in here about the the harmonic side of it yeah which is the condition that the tube go going into distortion mm. um there are again there are uh different aspects to distortion and different ways that different uh devices distort yeah um Generally speaking, again, with, with triodes, they tend to have the most natural sounding kind of distortion. Their distortion tends to be dominant in, in second harmonic. And the second harmonic is actually kind of musical. Musical instruments quite often generate second harmonics, mm -hmm. and that's what gives them some of their particular musical timbre. What Dan's talking about here with harmonics is the addition of sound waves that are two times, three times, four times, five times, etc. the frequency of the incoming signal. So looking at this image on screen, if you've got a sine wave coming in, which is the top sine wave there, the input in blue and the output in red are identical. If we add a second order harmonic, what we're doing is we're adding a level of distortion which is twice the frequency of the input signal. And what we get there on the right hand side is a distorted version of the original incoming sound wave. The issue is when we start to look at the third order harmonic, the distortion becomes a lot more turbulent. So the original shape of the wave has been more greatly distorted than the second harmonic. The way I tend to think about it is that the 
second order harmonics create less turbulence in the original sound. They are going to distort the waveform, but they're not creating as many ups and downs that are out of line with the original waveform. Whereas the odd order harmonics, your third, your fifth, your seventh, etc., to me, create more turbulence, and that's how I think of them, and why I believe they create a sense of harshness in the sound compared to the second, fourth, sixth, etc., even order harmonics. Now, that's just my layman's explanation. What is known to be a fact is that people perceptually prefer distortion that is in those even harmonics compared to those that are in the odd harmonics. For whatever reason, solid state equipment tends to distort in the odd order harmonics, which is often where I equate any glare or harshness or dryness to the sound. Whereas tubes have this even style harmonic distortion, which actually tends to be a much more pleasing, enjoyable sound as Dan's already alluded to. Something like a 300B or a 2A3 will go into that same kind of second harmonic distortion as it distorts. Transistors generally distort in uh, are more dominant in some of the odd order harmonics, and the odd order harmonics don't sound musical. They don't sound good. Um, of course, transistor designers will tell you, well, of course, that's why we put a ton of feedback in, so there's very mm. little distortion. But, but if you analyze the spectrum of distortion, it's not the quantity of a particular harmonic that really matters. It's it's the the, the relative levels between the odds and the evens. So okay. if you look at a if you look at a single ended tube, if you look at the, the, the THD figure, the total harmonic distortion figure at, at, at which we quote power outputs, the transistor guys freak out because we tend to use 5% or 10% total harmonic distortion. And for years, uh, solid state designers who use tons of feedback show these vanishingly low distortion yeah, figures zero, 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 one percent That's great. Uh, but when you look at the harmonic content when either of these devices eventually does go into distortion, the solid state devices tend to have a lot more of that odd har harmonic mm -hmm. stuff coming in. The tubes tend to still dominate in the even harmonics over the odd harmonics until they really go out the deep end and you're just driving them way too hard. So you can have a, an amp that is possibly going into a slightly distorted state and, and it might even make it sound a little better a little more musical mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a lot of speculation out there that that's part of the attraction of tubes and, and again particularly with these real simple single-ended circuits that have no global negative feedback uh, and and tend to have dominant second harmonic distortion I, at least i have a theory that those amps tend to uh bring out a little ambient sound bouncing around the room mm -hmm. as instruments play or the singer sings seems to come up a hair compared to other amps, particularly amps with a lot of feedback. And, and I don't know if it's just the feedback or if it's actually that that second harmonic distortion is creating a little bit more of that sense of the room around you. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's it for part one of the interview. In parts two, three, and probably four, Dan's going to go on and talk about some of the specific amplifier designs that they've had over the years, some of the philosophies around impedance matching and headphone matching of the amplifiers, and plenty of other conversations around the philosophy of audio enjoyment, have they approach amplifier design and the like. So if you've enjoyed this, this is really just the warm up. Do hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and stay tuned for parts two onwards of the interview with Dan Schmolly from Bottlehead. As always, thanks for watching, happy listening, and I'll see you next time here on Passion for Sound.